If you'll turn with me to Acts chapter 8, Acts chapter 8, we continue uh, to be looking at the story of the early, early uh, church and the first days of the church of Jesus Christ. We look at Acts chapter uh, 8 this morning. We're going to begin uh, with verse 3. It says, But Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. And the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was said by Philip when they heard him and saw the signs that he did. For unclean spirits came out of those who were possessed, crying out with a loud voice. And many who were paralyzed or lame were, bl- were healed. So there was much joy in the city. But there was a man named Simon who had previously practiced magic in the city and amazed the people of Samaria, saying that he himself was somebody great. They all paid attention to him from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the power of God that is called great. They paid attention to him because for a long time he had amazed them with his magic. But when they believed Philip as he preached good news about the kingdom of God and of the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. I want to roll down to the bottom of the chapter to verse 26. It says, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go toward the south to the road that goes from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and he went, and there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all of her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning seated in his chariot. And as he was reading from the prophet Isaiah, the spirit said to Philip, Go over and join the chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and saying, Do you understand what you are reading? He said, How can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. And now the passage of scripture that he was reading was this, Like a sheep that was led to slaughter, like a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opens not his mouth. And in his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, About whom, I ask you, does the prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with Scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop, and they went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself in Azotos, and as he passed through, he preached the gospel to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. Our Heavenly Father, I do pray that you'd be with us as we unpack just sections of this chapter. It's so full of profound truth for our lives. Lord, some of it will be familiar to us. Some of it will be new. And some of it, your spirit will just come upon us and say, this is what I need you to hear and know and do today. Lord, we pray for that fresh voice from the spirit as we look to your word today. We pray this in your name. Amen. I guess I'm going to talk primarily just to begin with here to guys Have you ever had a pair of jeans that at first you didn't particularly like, but after you'd worn them for a long time, they just started to get broken in. And before you knew it, they were your favorite pair of jeans of all time. And just the moment they get broken in, someone who lives in your house with you comes up to you and says, you cannot wear those anymore. They are worn out. They are disgusting. You, you can't wear those any other place. Maybe it's not a pair of jeans. Maybe it's a t-shirt. I mean, you know that you have got a favorite all-time great a t-shirt. Maybe it's not your jeans. Maybe it's not a t-shirt. Maybe it's a chair. Man, it's a great-looking recliner. I mean, Archie Bunker would be proud to own uh, that recliner. Just kind of look at that recliner, and you can just sit in there, and it almost swallows you up. It hugs you because it knows you so well. And again, somebody that you may be related to by marriage comes up to you and says, that 
is a health hazard in our house. It has got to go. Man, those are tough moments for us, aren't they? Uh, It's tough moments for us emotionally because we are attached to those things. They are our comfort zone. We know those things. They're comfortable. They're broken in. They're just the way we want them. We've been waiting forever for them to just fit and embrace us just that way. And the last thing we want to do is to change, to leave that comfort zone, to give up that broken in t-shirt for some stiff, starched shirt that just scratches and and it's going to be 15 years before it can get as comfortable as the shirt that you're having uh, to give up. We we may have cleaned out some closets at our house this week, so this is a little emotional for me uh, this morning. (laughs) But the truth of the matter is, that we can find some places where we're really, really comfortable. But sometimes there is a contrast between comfort and growth. And sometimes if we're going to grow and we're going to move and we're going to develop, we can't be stuck in the same things that we were doing a long time ago. And we have to let go of some of the things that we have embraced and held on to so tightly Because there's something new in our life that we need to have. When we look at the church here in Acts chapter 8, they are struggling with the fact that they have been holding on to comfort for so long. God has been doing wonderful, marvelous, profound, exciting things in Jerusalem, and they are loving every minute of it. In fact, Most of us would swap places to be in a church that exciting, that full, that growing, as that it's it's fantastic, and the church in Jerusalem is doing great. The only problem is, is that when Jesus had left, he said, go ye therefore into all the world and preach the gospel. And they're in Jerusalem. He told them, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem. Got it. But also Judea. Samaria and the uttermost parts of the world. And still, in these months and years after Jesus had given them these words, they are still in Jerusalem in large part because it's comfortable, it's broken in, it's known, it's what they've experienced, it's what they're used to. It's great. Why would you leave if it's going so great in that moment? What happens is that persecution breaks out. Persecution breaks out in the name of Saul. And Saul begins to pursue and arrest and in some cases execute believers. And that causes these believers to leave and go to Judea and Samaria and eventually the uttermost parts of the world. You see, they had to exchange their comfort in order to grow. And what we see here in Acts chapter 8 is this great transitional chapter chapter where they are moving from comfortable but moving into brand new places. And the gospel moves and the gospel grows. You see, sometimes We have to be pushed out of where we're comfortable to move to where God wants us to be. Now, I would also tell you to take a look in this passage, and I want you to see that there were people waiting to hear the gospel in the community of Samaria. Samaria was a place where you you know the story, the tensions of Samaria, but here they are, they are pushed to that place. And that entire community is waiting to hear the gospel. They are waiting to be rescued from a false gospel from Simon the magician. And probably even more starkly represented is the story of the Ethiopian who was riding home from Jerusalem, who had come to Jerusalem to worship because he was drawn to the name of God, but he did not understand, and he's riding home from Jerusalem, reading the scrolls that he probably bought in Jerusalem. And Philip comes up to him, led by the Spirit, and says, do you understand what you're reading? He says, man, how am I going to understand this if someone doesn't explain it to me? He was waiting for someone, somewhere, explain to me what is going on. And it was only after the church is pushed out of its comfort zone that it can grow in this new way. But the focus that I want to spend on this morning is not so much that movement inside of the life of the church, because you know that and you've heard that. 
But where I want to spend my attention this morning is I, I want to spend my attention this morning on the lives of the individuals that hear the gospel. Because there is a common thread that is throughout this passage of Scripture, and it is the thread of the response of the new believer to follow up in baptism. For them to come forward and say, because of my relationship to Jesus Christ, I want to be baptized. In fact, you see the pattern throughout the chapter 8. They believed and were baptized. They believed and they were baptized. Because I believe, why can't I be baptized is what the Ethiopian says at the end of the chapter. And just like it is for you, Man, coming forward for baptism, stepping into that water, stepping into that experience, which is a brand new experience for them, probably in Acts chapter 8, no one in the Acts chapter 8 had ever had a relative who had ever been baptized before. It was a major step from their comfort zone into a place of growth. I want to spend the rest of our time this morning thinking about uh, baptism. I want us to think about that uh, as we go on. Now, I do want to just mention to you, uh, I mentioned that I like to go to Wendy's last week uh, to get the Asiago spicy chicken sandwich. Very, very good. I highly recommend it. But at one of the other places that I like to go to eat is Zeus, the, the Greek cafe uh, across the highway there. And I, I love the chicken shawarma with an extra side of hummus and maybe an extra pita or two. It, it's really, really good. Sometimes I mix in the chicken shawarma pasta. It's got a little bit more kick, a little bit more spice to it. But, but generally, the chicken shawarma is, is my move with the pita and the hummus. And it's really tasty. I, I like chicken when it's, when it's got a little bit of that burned on the outside because they, they put it on that spit and it goes around. I, I like it a little bit, I like a little crunch in the chicken, I'm just going to tell you that. Um, one of the other reasons why I like to eat at Zeus is because sometimes I wonder, being Greek food, and the Apostle Paul spent years ministering in Greece, sometimes I eat my chicken shawarma with my pita and my hummus, and I wonder, I wonder if the Apostle Paul ever sat down and ordered the chicken shawarma and had a pita and had some hummus. I mean, wouldn't that be cool? Wouldn't that be cool if I was eating the same meal that the Apostle Paul ate? Now, side note, he probably wouldn't have eaten it at a cafe named Zeus. That, that just probably, I don't know, he was a missionary, he went places, I, I, I don't know. Uh, but just this idea that I'm eating the same food. There's something inside of my heart that's just got a little bit of, of a history bent that loves to do that. Years ago, uh, we went to England and went to St. Paul's Cathedral, uh, a worship place that has in, been in place for probably 1,500 years. And to walk through that place and to think how many generations of people have worshipped God in this building, from kings and queens to peasants and regular folks. And to stand in that same place where they had all worshipped. There's a connection that just kind of speaks to me when we think about connecting across history. Several years ago, I was in a meeting in Dallas, and we had a luncheon at First Baptist Church of Dallas. And at that time, the most famous preacher in Southern Baptist life was W.A. Criswell. And our lunch was in like the fellowship hall. But before we left, I wandered around the hallways until I found that sanctuary. And I stood by the place that W.A. Criswell had preached in that church for 50 years. That connection speaks to my life. But let me tell you that nothing connects us more powerfully than baptism. Baptism connects us to connect us with the believers from across the centuries and around the world. It's not so much that I'm eating the same sandwich that the Apostle Paul ate, but when I was baptized as a seven-year-old kid, I was baptized in the same way the Apostle Paul was baptized. I, I was baptized in the same way that generations and generations of believers have been baptized in the name of Jesus. 
And when you think about all the things that are different and changed, they spoke different languages, they lived in different cultures, they, they probably worshiped most of the time in somebody's house, they, they probably didn't have professional preachers and teachers, and they didn't have a Sunday school structure, and they probably sang different things. All of those things are different. But what connects us is our baptism. The same thing, it connects us with believers around the world. Pappy and Mio having served in Indonesia for years and years and, and providing flight support for people in villages that are almost impossible to get to other than by air. Those churches in those villages, when a person becomes a believer in Jesus Christ, they are baptized in the same way that you were baptized. My brother Andrew serves as a missionary in Peru when a believer in one of the churches in Peru comes to know Jesus Christ, they are baptized in that same way. Patrick Melanson, uh, who serves in Thailand, when the people there in Thailand today come to know Christ, they're going to be baptized in that same way. Baptism is this incredible thing because it connects us with believers from across the centuries and it connects us with believers from around the world. I want to point out another thing that's really important and really exciting about baptism, and that is that when we are baptized, and this may be the peak of, of the outline here, but when we are baptized, it connects us with Jesus Christ. When we are baptized, more important than connecting us with the Apostle Paul or, or all kinds of folks from history around the world, our baptism connects us with Jesus Christ. Now, baptism is an interesting thing. Baptism is not mentioned a single time in the Old Testament. And yet it's so important to us today. What is it that all of a sudden introduces baptism and makes it a big deal? As I've kind of looked this up and researched this and tried to understand this, one of the things that happens is, is you move back to try to understand where baptism comes from. In some degree, some of baptism comes from the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament. But the best that I think that we can understand it is in the Old Testament, you had some ceremonial cleaning cleansing. When you wanted to get serious before God, you would kind of cleanse yourself. You'd cleanse your hands. Sometimes the Pharisees and Jesus would argue about whether they'd wash their hands properly enough. That wasn't necessarily because they worked in a restaurant, but it was more so that because it said, listen, there are times in your life that you've got to get serious and you've got to cleanse. And what happened in this period of time is that people say, listen, don't just cleanse my hands but I want my whole body to be cleansed. And so there would come times in people's lives where they would say, listen, I, I have had God speak to me so deeply in my life that I don't want to just cleanse my hands. I want to cleanse my whole self. And I want to draw a new line and say, this is the new me. In fact, that's probably where we come to when we see John the Baptist preaching and baptizing in the wilderness. In fact, he even baptizes Jesus. But what's happening there is that John the Baptist is saying, listen, your lives are messed up. You need to hear from God. You need to repent. You need to start over with God. And if they would receive that message, they would come and they would be baptized. That's the story of baptism that comes up through the life of Jesus. But in Romans chapter 5, we discover that baptism has a brand new depth because Paul talks about the importance of baptism that Jesus received from John the Baptist, that all of the early believers in Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 5 and Acts chapter 5, all of these churches had received baptism. But in Romans chapter 5, Paul is teaching the church about what baptism means. And he says that when you are baptized, you are buried with him in death. And you are raised to new life. I hear that. When we are baptized, we are connected with the story of Jesus' death and resurrection. Now, I will tell you that there's nothing mystical, there's nothing supernatural that happens when we are baptized, but basically we are saying that story, that experience when Jesus was buried, that's my story. 
And more importantly, that story of when Jesus was raised, that's my story. Sometimes you want to tell somebody something interesting about your life. Well, here's a conversation starter. I was buried and rose again. Because that's the story that we have in Christ. He died for my sins. He was raised in defeat of sin. And when we baptize, we are baptized, we connect to that story. And just like those believers in Philippi, just like the Ethiopian in the middle of the desert who found a pond of water, we say, that was my story. That is my story. That belongs to me as well. Man, I love that. But when you are baptized, you are connecting yourself to Jesus. Now, I also want to point out from this passage that baptism connects us with Christians from across the century. Baptism connects us with Jesus. But I also want you to notice that baptism separates us from our old story. Baptism separates us from our old story. One of the things that's happening in baptism is it's drawing a line that says, before I knew Christ, this is who I was. This is what I chased after. This is what I pursued. This is what my hope was. But now that I've met Christ, I have a new hope, a new purpose, a new pursuit, a new center for my entire life. Baptism separates us from our old story. Now, this is an important moment here as we think about this. You know, as I was putting this outline together, I was trying to figure out, now, do I, is that exactly what I want to say? Do, is there another way that I could say that? Because there's a little bit of a sense that it's possible that someone say, listen, I don't want to draw a line from my old story. Who are you to say that I need to draw a line from my old story? I like my old story. Man, I was kicking it in high school. I mean, I, I've been doing great. Who says that I need to, to draw a line and separate myself from who I was? And I'll be honest with you, I, I can hear that. And I can hear that wrestling and say, listen, man, don't, don't be kicking who I used to be. But let me say this as tenderly and as carefully as I can. What it means to become a believer in Jesus Christ is to draw a line that separates us from our old story. It is to say the path, the pursuit, the direction of who I used to be is not who I am today and it's not who I want to be. Now listen, all of us had things that we had our moments of kindness, we had our moments of love, we had great personality. All of those things may be true. But the whole point of what Jesus did in our life was that he, the whole point of what Jesus did in our life was is that he says, who you are is not enough to come before God. And you must exchange you must exchange what I've done for you for what you can do for yourself. Now listen, that's a non-negotiable. You see, our faith in Jesus Christ isn't just a sticker that we can add to our life. It isn't just an extra ornament that we can add to our life. It is two things. Our faith in Jesus Christ is our trust in the Lordship of Jesus Christ to be in charge of our life moving forward, and it is a repudiation it is a rejection of who we used to be and saying who I used to be was not right and was not good enough. And baptism helps us draw that line. You know, I think sometimes we don't take that repudiation side strongly enough. We just try to ease, just try to merge in our faith into our old life. When I think that baptism says, listen, this is who I used to be, and now this is who I am. I want you to think about those believers there in Samaria. 
None of their neighbors may have been baptized. None of their relatives may have ever been baptized. This guy Philip shows up from Jerusalem. Boo his Jerusalem. We can't stand Jerusalem. And he's telling us the story about Jesus and we're not so sure about Jesus. He sounds like a Jewish prophet. We're not interested in that. But something inside of their heart stirred and said, this is truth. You respond to it. And they believed. And through baptism, they drew a line and said, I, worshiped, I used to worship a God I didn't understand. I used to pursue different things. But now, it's Jesus. Jesus is the center of all I am. And baptism helps us to draw that line. I have to confess something to you. Susan and I lived in Florida for a long time. Now, now we grew up in Florida, and then we lived in Florida as adults. Now, when we were growing up, and we grew up about 15 miles away from each other, although we didn't ever meet each other in, in, in high school, and that's probably okay because I was way too cool. She would have been very intimidated by me. Um, but, but, but growing up, we, we grew up in Pinellas County. She lived in Clearwater. I lived in St. Petersburg. And, and growing up, we probably both went to the beach an awful lot. Now, not necessarily the same beach, uh, but... So we maybe, you know, I don't know. We didn't go to the same beach very much at all. But growing up, we went to the beach all the time. But something happened as we continued to live in Florida as grown-ups. And we, we stopped going to the beach. And, and we lived, I mean, we le never lived more than five miles from the beach. We, we lived in West Palm Beach when we were in college. And we were close to Palm Beach and Singer Island, beautiful, beautiful uh, beaches there. We, we moved to Fort Lauderdale, and there was uh, Fort Lauderdale Beach and, and Hollywood Beach. And Hollywood Beach has got a great uh, boardwalk that you can go and ice cream shops and stuff like that. But, but we never went. Later on, we lived in Panama City, home of the world's best beaches. And then there was the Panama City Beach, which you all have heard about. But let me tell you the little secret. If you go, Mexico Beach is the place to go to. Nobody goes to Mexico Beach. It's fantastic. It's wonderful. It's the exact opposite direction of Panama City Beach. Don't tell them I told you about it, but it's a fantastic place. And, and I don't know why we didn't go. Some of it may have been the kids, and it was just an awful lot of work to do there. Some of it may have been that we were local, and so it's like, why well, go to the beach? That's what the tourists do. You know, we, we'll, we'll go some other time, but we just never went. Maybe we didn't necessarily like the crowds. I, I don't know why. But no offense, we moved here, and then we're like, huh, why didn't we go to the beach? We lived five miles from the beach. What were we thinking? And we're like trying to plan vacations to go to the beach. Not like, it was right there. What were we thinking? How did we not go to the beach? It was there. Now listen, before you laugh at me anymore, I want to ask you the same thing about baptism. I want to ask you the same thing about baptism. If you haven't been baptized as a believer in Christ, to believe in who he is, to make him in charge of your life, and then to celebrate that with baptism, I don't want you to answer this out loud, but, but why not? It's right there. Let, let me tell you that baptism is one of the great, great privileges of being a believer in Christ. Just like living 3.4 miles from the beach is a great privilege. You would be a knucklehead to live that close to the beach and not go to the beach. You, can I say this with a lowercase k? I won't say, but it would be crazy. To be a believer in Jesus Christ and say, baptism, eh, I'll pass. Listen, the first believers believed and were baptized. All the way through the book of Acts, we're going to see they believed and they were baptized. Baptism is what connects us to Jesus. Baptism is what helps us in our obedience and our growth draw a line and say, I am a new person. So what I ask you is, man, just the same thing that the 
the Ethiopian asked Philip, what keeps you from being baptized? You know, I had my list of excuses why we didn't go to the beach, but they don't hold up. You know, maybe it's the crowd. You know, I don't know. Maybe it's your kids, maybe it's your parents. I, I don't know. But I want to challenge you as a believer in Jesus Christ. If you have Christ living inside of you because you've made that commitment to him, would you celebrate that with baptism? We're going to have a time of response in just a minute. Listen, I don't want to put any undue pressure on you, and we're not going to overdo this, but I want to put this invitation out there as strongly as I can. Man, why not get baptized? If you haven't been baptized, I would love to hear from you this morning. Maybe you can just kind of come forward this morning and just say, I I'm nervous, I'm scared, that this is really way outside of my comfort zone. But, but I'm ready to get baptized. And we can schedule that, maybe we can do it next week, maybe you want to have some folks here and it'll be two or three weeks. But maybe this morning you need to come and you need to say, I'm ready to be baptized. I'm scared to death, but I can't think of any good reason why I shouldn't get baptized. Maybe you're not quite there. And maybe what you need to do in this week is that you need to honestly ask God. Say, God, do you want me to be baptized? Is that something you want for my life? Parentheses, I know the answer to that. But maybe you and he just need to have that conversation. And you're going to spend some time in these days just saying, God, I... I don't know, I've been putting it off. I, I, I've been thinking it wasn't really that big a deal. And, and I, you, know, you know, maybe I was baptized before I was a believer. I, you know, whatever it is, you have that conversation with God and say, listen, I'm, I'm going to talk to God about it. And I'm going to be obedient to what he calls me to do. And maybe, maybe in this week, you've already had that argument. You've already kind of wrestled your way through that and and you've got the list of things, I, I would accept this, 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 and this. Maybe your assignment this week is to say, God, would you take these obstacles, these barriers, and these blockades, and would you show me how to move those out of my life so that they don't stand between what I feel like the Spirit of God has been calling on me to do? Now listen, we're going to close in prayer. Becky's going to be down front. Richard's going to be down front. We want to hear from you. We, we really want you to have the boldness to, to say, I'm ready to be baptized. I, I have no idea how many folks have been baptized and not about, been baptized here, but I know that we have folks every Sunday that are believers that have not been baptized. If you would like to do that, we'd love for you to do that. Listen, if, it's, if the walking forward is, is too much for you, Man, text me, talk to me. I'll be at the back doors there. Talk to me there. But man, we, we, we'd love for you to just take that step and say, man, I'm ready to do this. All right, let's pray together.